Uh, welcome to another Lancaster Safety Webinar. Obviously, today's topic is going to be on how to sell the boss on safety. Uh, my name is Nick Spinda, and I'm here with our founder and CEO, Jeffrey Lancaster, uh, who has been in the business for quite some time now and uh, is an active special government employee through the VPP program of OSHA. And we're going to be kind of explaining to everyone how you can go about you know getting your boss to maybe take more action and move with forward with a safety program or for a lot of you I imagine enhancing the safety program you have um, as we go through these uh, this presentation you know it's going to be an interactive experience and and we highly encourage you to click on the insta safety polls you know some of the answers maybe you don't know but certainly you know click give it your best guess this way you know you know we can kind of gauge where you're at plus it just makes it more interesting and fun for everybody I believe uh, with that you know I'd like to let Jeff uh, kind of introduce himself a little bit and about our company a bit more thank you, Nick, and certainly want to welcome everyone and thank everyone for taking your precious time to make yourself better in the safety profession basically and we're uh, very hopeful you're going to gain a lot from uh, this presentation. A little bit about our company, it's Lancaster Safety Consulting, Inc. On the slide, you'll see the LSCI, or if we let an LSCI slip, we're referring to our, our own company, as many companies uh, and organizations use uh, acronyms uh, these days. But the knowledge that we've put together here comes from many, many years of experience. Uh, we serve as clients nationwide. We have many consultants go in. We're going to share things that we've learned you know, uh, from our many other clients and put this together so you can take home some information uh, you know, from this presentation. So what is the goal? What is the goal of presentation? Basically, I want to provide you all with more information. We're going to go over time-tested methods for health and safety management. Uh, we're going to focus on the business reasons that support being proactive rather than reactive with health and safety. We're going to provide factual support or at least show you where to get a majority of the factual uh, support and information you'll need to convince the boss about safety. When I refer to the boss, I don't know if you have one or two people in your organization or one or two thousand. There could be a, a board of directors. Maybe you are the boss, but the point is it's a team effort. Everyone has to buy into safety. The trouble is if the executive management team doesn't buy into it to the, the, to the level it should, it's going to make your job uh, more difficult in getting uh, money you need budgeted and allocated for safety. Now, one of the neat things about these webinars are the Insta safety polls. So basically we're going to have our first one coming up here where we're going to ask you these questions. You just click on the answer and it's interactive so you'll be able to see the response you know, from everybody else and we'll, we'll discuss it here momentarily. So this first one that comes up, uh, executive management uh, culture check. Do the words safety and health appear in all three? Your employment agreement, your company's mission statement, and the home page on your website. So we see the respondents, we see the responses coming in. Jeff, what would you say? I mean, what, what do you expect for this to be? I mean, you know, you, we've been, we have a lot of companies, even some of our clients, um, you know, and it's sad to say that, you know, not enough are really making this emphasis, um, you know, as much as even we stress to our clients having it right on their web page, uh, you know, and I know we've recently started allowing a lot of our clients that we actually go ahead and, and help them develop that part of their web page, um, which makes things a lot easier. But uh, mission statements and, you know, how many companies are sitting down as they're making their mission statement and actually, you know, putting this down on paper is, is making safety a priority. Well, that's the key. Uh, we all, when I say we all, I mean, virtually everybody in your organization that is involved with safety. You would like to think that you're doing the best job. We have it covered. You want to go to bed at night thinking, I've done everything we can to uh, achieve, you know, safety. But these are just three ideas here, and it was mixed. It was mixed with the uh, responses. 
but to sell top executive management, you have to give them information. That's part of your role. We're going to discuss a lot today about what your actual role is. So these are three ideas. Companies that have the best safety practices will present their new hires. They'll talk about the importance of their own of the the, the prospective employee right at, at the beginning, starting the culture, bringing everybody new into your organization. It should be clearly stated right up front on an employment agreement, if in fact you use employment agreements, how important safety is. Let the new applicant know that you mean business, we don't want anyone hurt, and they don't want, um, you know, they don't want their actions to hurt anybody else. How about the mission statement? If your company has one, take a quick look at it. On the first page or in that statement, does it have the, the care and concern of mentioning health and safety for the workers and all that are involved at the work site? And then your website. You probably have, most websites these days do have something, some statement about caring about the health and safety of their workers, but is it on the home page? Is it right up front? So we've already given you some ammo here. If, if any of this is lacking, just take notes of it, build your case. When you're talking to management, you say, let's try to pattern ourselves after the world-class corporations, the world-class safety programs, and that tells you culture check. Are you already mentioned? Is your company already mentioned in these three areas, or is that an improvement, something you can uh, suggest on? All right. The big three selling points. Uh, these are uh, nothing new, uh, but we're going to really touch on these. Uh, the moral, ethical. You can ask your management team. We don't want anybody to get hurt, do we? The legal issue. Well, this is the law. We don't. We want to comply with the law, don't we? And now the big one, number three, has to do with money. It. It costs less to be proactive versus reactive. This is what you tell your boss. We want to minimize our expenses and maximize profits, right? Now you're talking the business language that the people run your company that have the very difficult job trying to find enough job or not enough money, enough time and money resources to get everything done. Notice we have uh, two pictures of the posters, the OSHA posters. The one on the left has been out there for many years, and OSHA just updated their workplace poster. But the thing that's consistent on it, you'll see each poster says, it's the law. That can be a tiebreaker in itself when you're having heated discussions like, well, we got to pave the parking lot. We need a new van. Our copy machine's done. The roof's leaking. Uh, we need to borrow on a credit line to pay taxes and uh, foreign competition and on and on and on. Don't get mad or frustrated at that, but just understand these are problems your coworkers have to deal with. And this is a tiebreaker, the, the legal. It's the law. If you find something, some condition in your company, it's a, it's a delicate matter, but it's your job as a safety, uh, safety manager to identify hazards and call, call the hazards to the attention of the supervisors. So that's, that's a tiebreaker argument. If you find something serious, hold on a minute. This needs prioritized. This needs immediate attention. We're not in lawful compliance. We need to get into compliance. And then let, let your boss, your management team, make the decision from there. So, you know, in answering these questions, of course, no one wants anybody hurt. Of course, you would think, of course, that your company wants to run, run it uh, legitimately and within the realm. The, the trouble is, a lot of times, management doesn't know what the laws are. They don't know what the requirements are. So that's your job, to inform them. A lot of times, decisions are made when managers and people making the decision don't understand what their full requirements are. And then, of course, the business argument. Now, there's, there's a great tool on OSHA's website, and, and the uh, link is at the bottom. You'll see, you'll see these links as time goes on. We want to get through the, the uh, webinar today, of course, and we will, and we're going to even answer some questions uh, at the end. But if we don't get to your answer or if you can't read these links, by all means, feel free to contact us after the webinar, 
and uh, we will point you in the right direction. But getting back to the, 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 this link here, it's right on OSHA's website. It's called OSHA Safety Pay Program. And you can, we encourage you to check it out and even plug in your own company's illnesses and injuries from your OSHA 300 summary, or actually the actual log. And it's astounding what the indirect and direct cost of injuries are. Now you can get the attention of the folks in your company that have the difficult tasks of allocating money and prioritizing. If you can show them what the real cost of injuries are over a three or four year period, and all the studies show put money into safety to avoid the injuries uh, from happening in the first place. So you're saying that this calculator is going to allow them to put in a specific injury and, and OSHA is going to use empirical data to actually come back with the, the monetary cost of, of, of such incidents? Yes, uh, that's, that's right, Nick. I mean, it's, it's astounding. I mean, they, uh, they have all the factors in there uh, that's associated. It's not just a lost work day for you know, a week or so. But when you add up all the other costs involved, it's staggering. So that can really get management's attention. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, and I think it's important for uh, you know the, our our people out there listening, you know, and maybe they're frustrated and they, they got to understand what their role is as a safety professional or as someone that is um, you know helping out with the safety program. So so why don't we go into that a little bit? And what you know everybody thinks of safety people as you know doing trainings and writing procedures, but there's a lot more that goes into it when you when you get into this profession, isn't there? Well there sure is. And and things that I like to uh, you know when we do consulting and speak to middle management, we speak frankly and we're gonna try to do that today. And an interesting point came up in one of my consultations a few years ago. So, well, that's not part of my job. That's not. It may not be part of your job. It's part of your role. So what we're trying to do with this slide is say, how many of you have a, a, either an employment agreement or a definition, a definition of your duties that says, in addition to your health and safety duties, you must be a salesperson an ambassador dedicated to providing overwhelming evidence to the executive manager of your company as to why they should spend more money on the health and safety program. I seriously doubt if any of you <laughs> have language like that in there. Is selling the value of your job? Did, 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 you, did you go to school to learn how to sell? No, you're in the safety profession. Of course, with today's webinar, we want to emphasize selling is a part of your job. You have to convince management. You convince everybody to work safely under you and, and the folks in the management chain beside you have to buy into your efforts and so does executive uh, management. And then when it comes to that, you know, now now we it's important for, you know, to understand what management's role in all this process is, you know, so the safety person needs to be part salesman. So what about the actual managers? Well, that that's that's a key too, Nick. Uh, the uh, understand your coworkers have different duties than you do. The president of a company had, I mean, the, the people that run the company have a fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of their company. So what if there's a loss this quarter? What if there's not enough cash? Yet the timing is you've recognized something needs done with safety. This is, this is where the clash is. You're doing your job, the person allocating funds doing their job. It might be bad timing. This is a problem that all companies have and you have to discuss it frankly and open. If there is no money, I mean, you have to take alternative means to uh, assure the safety. And, and maybe you can put something into the budget, make a, a quick fix uh, to, you know, to, so the workers are safe and then make a long-term investment on, on the safety. But a, a sound business plan includes minimizing expenses. That's another thing you're up against. If anyone, you know, the, the sound business uh, practices include, well, you know, don't spend any money unless you have to. You have to pay taxes. You have to pay payroll. Do you have to? pay for more safety training? You don't have to. That's where your role comes in. You're a salesperson. You have to have legitimate and up-to-date information so the management team can make a decision. 
they're going to ask, why should we spend more on safety? And you better be ready for that. So never just ask for safe, ask for increased budget without having good good backup. And I, I would ask everyone here uh, that don't get mad. It is frustrating. It's okay to get a little frustrated, but don't get mad at personnel in, in your company or frustrated. But today's webinar, we want to teach understand the situation. And you rise above it, and you present it uh, manager to manager, you know, to, to uh, your management team. So you have to respect, you have to know your role, but you have to respect the role of others in the company, which leads us up to our next Instapol, right, Nick? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, so we have another Instapol coming up here, and, and this is a good one too. Uh, and it's it's not, you know, obviously I think everybody looking for what the answer we're looking for here, but does your company view safety as an expense or an investment? And and I think that's going to be a lot different than uh, maybe what you know safety professionals view it as. But you know, again, going into that culture of the actual company, you know. Is your company out there? Are they when you go to them and ask for safety equipment or safety training? Are they looking at that as a as an expense, or are they looking at that uh, obviously in, in in the way we'd like to look at it as the investment? Well, that's right, and it, these are business terms too. What is an expense? What is an investment? So, a couple examples of an expense: uh, an OSHA fine. An expense is basically you pay something. And it's gone. That's an expense. You don't get any return on your investment. Another example would be attorney fees, unbudgeted, unplanned. That and these are two big expenses that can be directly related to an accident or an injury, you know, at your workplace. On the other hand, what's an investment? Well, if you're purchasing something, if you buy a desk for a thousand dollars. You have an asset of a thousand dollars. You don't have the cash anymore, but you have a new ad. You've got a return on your investment. That desk could last what twenty years, thousand dollars. How's the math? You know. So if you look at that way, gee, that desk is expensive. It's a thousand dollars. Yeah, but it's going to last twenty years, and we can put a person there producing there. So it's that's a that's an investment, and business owners understand the difference between expense and investment. And it's their role not to spend money unless they absolutely have to. Your role is to convince them that the health and safety is an investment. It's not an expense. And, and that really brings us back to you know the, the whole part about we need to educate the executives, um, you know, and and that's that's where salesmanship comes in. But when you're selling, you're not always just selling and, and giving them. It's it's all more about education and give them the information because. If you really present it in the right light and you give them the proper information, they're going to be able to, you know, see the value in this, and, and that's really what it's all about: is, is giving that education. Um, you know, it's, and as you can see, you know, and, and Jeff, you know, I'm sure you're going to talk here about how how vital of a responsibility that is. Well, it is. They control the purse string. What's the old saying? You know, the the who controls the purse string? So the money has to come. If you have goals, uh, you know, part of it, to achieve those goals, it takes money. Just think about where it comes from and how you can get the money. So that's that's part of your role is educating executives. Maybe they made decisions on budget uh, and they didn't know the latest information that's going on with, say, OSHA reporting requirements or some of the other other things. It's a changing world. You, your your role is to keep up to, updated with all that, and you want to avoid complacency. A uh, few examples here. Well, you know, we haven't had, we've been in business for years, we haven't had too many injuries. Or we're v, a vol, VPP site, Voluntary Protection Program site. We're approved by OSHA. You're one of the safest companies in America. That's complacency. Uh, Safety is only, you can't live on the past. Something can happen today. Nobody ever plans for a, an accident or an injury to occur. Uh, other feedback from from management can be well our as far as our workers comp insurance our experience modification rate is down we're I checked you know we, we have a low rate amongst our industry well it could get better or if it ain't broke don't fix it uh, we are in a lean mode with the economy these are all reasons these, these are your challenges uh, in a way they're right but 
you can't just uh, you can't just rest on your laurels. So you have to present a cost versus a benefit. We've already given you some of those ideas. We're about to give you more. Which Nick, what's up next year? Oh, it looks like we have another Insta Safety poll that's going to be popping up on your screen here. And again, we do encourage all of our participants to you know be active in these because uh, you know again it's nice to see where your peers are at, and it's also good for us to know where we stand or, or where you guys stand. Uh, in the event of a severe injury or fatality, the employer has the duty to report to, uh, to OSHA only the following conditions: um, that be a workplace fatality, uh, hospitalization. Um, and again, you can go true or false on that. All right, we're seeing the uh, participants, and thank you for this. Makes it looks, like, looks like most of them are saying false. It, it seems like people are pretty educated up to the new rules, which is good. Uh, but not everybody is is saying false. So, and by the way, some of these poll questions are no definite right answer, but but this one is clearly false. Uh, and we're going to go into, we're going to explain two differences uh, with the new reporting and record keeping requirements. This, we're going to attempt to uh, clarify. There's been two things that happened recently. One, the first one, it's up here, and apparently the majority of our listeners are aware that as of January 1st of this year, the requirements change. That's why it, it's false. For years, the the question was the answer was false. For years, uh, employers just had to report uh, a fatality or a hospitalization of three or more. Now the requirements got a little more strict. Still have to report a fatality within eight hours. Uh, uh, you have to report a work-related inpatient hospitalization. So that's not just one person going to the emergency room. That would be one, at least one person being admitted to the hospital. Does your management team know about this? Do they know that if all of a sudden you have an accident, it's your duty to report that to OSHA now? Maybe when they made the bu this year's budget last year, when this wasn't in play or they weren't advised of it, they said, well, we're, we're a pretty safe company. Let's, let's not disturb it. Let's just keep the budget the same. We're doing fine. So it's your your duty to stay stay up on this. Obviously, uh, OSHA added an, another another condition is an amputation or a loss of an eye. So all that has to be uh, reported. There's more information there. Uh, there is going to be a home page where you can report this. In the meantime, you either call your local area office or the OSHA number, uh, the national office that's listed there. So the point with this is. Do they know what effect this has? If somebody accidentally gets hurt, they must call OSHA. OSHA will most likely come out and inspect, are you ready? Do you have all your written programs in order? Do you have all your machinery, all your railings, all your slip trip falls, all your training documented? You never know. It's too late. You can't do it in one day after the, what's the old saying, a horse gets out of the barn. Now that, I'm going to pause just a moment, Nick, because that's in effect and as we saw, the majority of our listeners know that's in effect. But there's another part we, we'd like to explain here. And that is, we have this underlined here. It's a proposed rule, which it, it's now a final rule, actually, of re, uh, record-keeping reporting requirements. Now, this is being written as we speak. Last time I checked with OSHA National Office, they... Uh, expect it to be totally completed and in effect this fall. Now, that's been pushed back from March to September, but the point is, the old saying, it's a done deal. This is not proposed anymore. It's been gone through the public comment period, and it's important as safety professionals for you to know the difference between what we just explained that went into effect January 1st, 2015, and what's going to go into effect it, you know, right around the corner in the fall here. Companies with, now some companies that are high risk, uh, high hazard companies who have 250 employees or more will be required to submit their, their OSHA 300s via email directly to OSHA on a quarterly basis. So basically, so basically if I gather this right, it's just going to have a giant database 
of everybody's injuries and illnesses, and it's going to be extremely easy for them to go in, find out who, which companies are having the most injuries, so they can target their inspections better. Is that what yeah, you're saying? That's what the news releases, uh, you know, explain from OSHA and smaller companies, 20 or more employees, Nick, uh, will be required to submit them annually. So, did you know? I mean, we're going to be I mean, use some phrases over and over and over again, but I think this is real important. Does your management team, the people in your organization that say yes or no to budget allocation and training and everything that needs Now, with the first thing that went into vent, uh, effect, somebody cuts a tip, a little tip off their finger, that's considered an amputation. Do they know, does your team know, you have to report that. Do they know what's on the, the very short horizon now with uh, having to submit your injuries? How have they been? If you've got a lot of injuries, who do you think they're going to prioritize? OSHA's themselves say they're under budgeted and, and understaffed, so they're going to prioritize. If you have a lot of injuries to submit, and they also look at your, your, your industry too. So this is all part of, of transparency in government. And Nick, it's it's my understanding this can be reported. Uh, these injuries are going to be listed well, on the Well, that a great point. Uh, the business aspect is you're selling the boss, and you know we get this quite frequently. Is someone gets a, a a repeat or a willful or even a serious violation, and they're afraid about that costing them business, especially with the pre-qualification sites out there. Um, you know, and and they're trying to put up their best face for trying to get you know bigger customers. And now OSHA is going to be, you know, coming in there and, and giving them these violations, and that's all going to be public record. More ammo, you know, more reason to sell the boss on safety. Now we're touching on people in your organization that could be uh, responsible for public relations, for advertising, uh, HR, hiring and tracting. If you're thinking about going to work for somebody, do you check them out these days? Uh, pretty easy to do. Go online and check out safety and, and see what type of record there is. See how you're doing with your competitors. So the public relations is important and uh, you know it, it's just, just more evidence to be uh, proactive with safety and to advise uh, you know your, your team on these things. Uh, a great example of transparency and really backing up the statement is, is Alcoa, uh, one of the most renowned corporations in America. And they've been recognized by Dr. David Michaels uh, multiple times on speeches. Dr. Michaels, by the way, Nick, as we know, is the, uh, is the head of OSHA. He's the Assistant Secretary of Labor. And he is uh, praised, rightfully so, Alcoa, for being a leader and actually on the Alcoa website, they they list the actual injuries occur. They want everybody to see and everybody in their organization to know we are doing everything we possibly can to prevent injuries. When something comes up, we want to share what happened so we can learn from the experience so others can learn from the experience. I mean, and that's amazing. So, like, you know, someone gets injured at Alcoa and it's just posted right on their website. Yeah. So does that scare them? That's another culture check with management. Here, that's what Alco is doing. They're at any time, 24/7. You can check out a website. There's other companies that do this too. And yet, if your if your boss has to cringe, what? We have to now report our our hospitalization. In a few months, we're going to have to submit our our. Well, I'm going to call my trade associate. Well, it's too late for that. You know, if they're if that's a problem, that tells you the culture isn't where it needs to be with your management. You, you have to be transparent. If you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing with safety, it shouldn't be a, a problem at all. Accountability, too. Accountability and because you know, the devil's advocates, you know, during the comment period, told, well, this is going to cost a lot of money. And OSHA thought once they have the, uh, the reporting page up, it's going to take about they estimate fourteen dollars. So if you have, you have to keep your log anyway, that's not a new requirement. And now to submit it within a minute or two's time, that doesn't cost much money. So 
uh, we think it's a good thing. OSHA can do trending and, and find out about things. They, uh, there's great examples. There's a wealth of information. There's a couple uh, you know, links here mentioned there. You can go on a website and check out uh, everything that uh, OSHA listed on the new final rule for uh, record keeping reporting. So, and another example, Nick, of, of training and the big three, you know, we, we remember number two, we want to make sure we're in compliance, don't we? Well, the, 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 the GHS, the Global Harmonization System, is still in the process of being switched over so that uh, foreign comp countries, especially Canada and the U.S., can be on the same page. So the first requirement for training was December 1st, 2013. If any of you listeners here have not trained your, your workers on the labeling requirements for the new hazard communication global harmonization system, if you didn't do this by December 1st, 2013, you missed it. Well, you need to get this done. You need to switch, you know, update your MSDSs to SDSs. You should know all about this and you have to make sure part of your role that your management team knows about this. So going back to our first couple slides of big three, when you ask somebody, we want to be in compliance with the law, don't we? Well, of course we do. Well, this is salesmanship 101. Well, we missed the deadline for training. I want to point it out to you. Uh, whatever reason we missed it, we need to get our workers trained. It wasn't in the budget, but since you said and agree we want to be in compliance with the, the OSHA requirements, we need to find the money to get our folks trained on this. We also need to update our MSDSs to SDS. How are we going to do that, management might say. We were laying people off for production. Here's a classic example. I'll give a little pitch for uh, consulting companies. It, they can come in and help you with this. It was it, This is tasks that you don't, this would be tasks that you're, Workers don't do on a regular basis. It, it you know, cuts into your production time, et cetera. It makes perfect sense to outsource this to get a little help on this. But that's yet another example of, of how you can approach when you find out about something. You can approach the team and say, we want to be in compliance with the law, don't we? And yeah, and I mean, and there's a there's a lot of useful information out there. I mean, we always, you know, here at Lancaster Safety, we're just about everybody in the office is continually on OSHA's website. I mean, they're constantly putting out tons of information. Again, the transparency in government, they want people to have it. It's not supposed to be a secret. Um, so pretty much everything they do. So we always like to highly encourage everybody to visit OSHA.gov, you know, search around on there. You're going to find a lot of useful information, which we've re referenced a few links. Um, but obviously, there's a ton more information that we'll probably never even get a chance to to really get into all of it. But uh, Jeff, why don't we uh, point out a few quick other links that might be useful to to our listeners? Well, yes, I'm sure you all know about OSHA.gov, and and that's where we get our information. That's where where you can as too. Uh, you can too. The there's a, a biweekly newsletter that summarizes. Uh, I'm not saying you have to look at OSHA.gov every day, but this newsletter summarizes the key topics every two weeks. comes right to your computer. And there's also news releases that are just about every day. You can get these sent, the RSS feeds, right to your computer. Well, speaking of those news releases, Very helpful. Too, uh, one of the key things on those, and uh, this is kind of amazing, is that on the news releases, they'll have people that they've given these large fines to. Uh, that's one of the big sections they do have right on their website, which uh, is astonishing. You know, they're just they're putting it right out there, letting everybody know, and they're actually emailing it out to people. And, and that'd be another thing to tell. You know, do we want to be? You know, you go to your boss. Do we want to be? You know, focus of this newsletter. I mean, is is that really going to send the right signal uh, to to all our stakeholders? Exactly. And there's a, there's another uh, segment under compliance. Uh, the establishment search, where you can look up by either SIC, Specific Industry Code, or the new NAICS, North American Industrial Coding System, I think it is. You can check out competitors, your own record, just like prospective employees, clients, uh, you know, pe people your, your company's 
putting bid work out to. You have to show management what transparency it can make or break a company. And maybe, you know, you can use this tool too to point out, to print out some activity of competitors and show management how your safety lines up with, with others. You can also check for local and national emphasis programs uh, that are announced every year and they're, they're You'll find them on the website too, on OSHA.gov, and it increases. It's one thing to say, "Hey, there, you know, we're in the plastic business, and there's an emphasis program. OSHA's going to be inspecting uh, plastic companies." You tell your boss it. likelihood of an OSHA inspection. When we decided on the budget last year, there was no emphasis program for our industry. Now there is. Do we want to sit and hope, or do we want to be proactive yeah, to make sure everything, too everything's is, in order? And kind of getting, taking what you said and a little bit what I said just a few minutes ago. Here's an idea. For everybody listening, go on to the... Go on to OSHA's website, find a few people that are in your industry that have gotten these large fines, that have these reputations. Go up to your boss and ask them if they'd like to do business with this company. And then turn it around on them and say, well, what if we were that company? Wouldn't you think that the, the person in the other chair would be thinking the same thing? Exactly. Uh, negative versus uh, Negative versus positive uh, publicity. I mean, there's no comparison. And a few years ago, OSHA opened the Severe Violators Enforcement Program, known as the SVEP. And they, this is a list that no company wants to be on. And you c it doesn't matter how long you've been in business, how, what your past record is. If, if OSHA believes that uh, your company's been a repeat offender or willful, they will place you, you know, they can place you into this this program and you're in it at least three years. So, which I mean, brings it looks like we have uh, another we have safety next poll coming this? up. And uh, again, please uh, participate here because we, we do appreciate that. But OSHA can uh, circulate a news release. And again, the news releases we've been talking about and place an establishment into its SVEP even before the establishment has had a chance to respond to the initial citations. True or false? Well, the results are coming in, and uh, it's almost hard to believe that they'd be able to do this. Let's go to the answer, and it, it's well, yeah. But the uh, let's go to the answer, and it, it's the results. By the way, were mainly true, and true is is the correct answer. And uh, you know what? What about innocent until proven guilty? I mean, in Europe, it's opposite. You're guilty until proven innocent, and in the U.S supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. But uh, OSHA, after they, they have up to six months to do an investigation, and if it's their determination, their opinion, that the establishment uh, is a severe violator, they'll put a news release out, and they'll, they'll place the company into this uh, program. And again, you just don't want to be in there. You'd rather get pause of news so, I mean, obviously really comes down on, to, on your you know, company. We're, we're arming them with all this information. Uh, you're the safety director of a company. How, how do you go about using this information we're giving out today, uh, you know, in a, in a going and approaching that boardroom or your boss or whoever the powers to be? Well, this slide recaps a lot of what, what we've been, your question specifically, Nick, and what we've been covering. First, you must, it's your job. Again, it might not be in your, your job description, but in your profession, I mean, it, you must keep up with current events. That's going to be your greatest source of ammo uh, for, you know, selling the boss on safety. Next, be selective. Once you, you first get these, uh, if you're not subscribed to OSHA quick takes or the uh, news releases, you, you're, you get all excited and, and, and think, geez, I, my boss got to know this, got to know that. You got to you got to read them all and be selective. Don't bombard management team with a, a bridge company that, that was painting and got a fall protection fine. You know, if, if you're a, man, a plastics plant, well, that's construction. That doesn't apply to me. Try to say be selective. Find other in this, I mean, in other companies in in your industry and let them know. Geez, look what happened here. Look how this guy got hurt. 
look how this company got fined. Uh, would we survive? You know, would we survive that? What can we do about it? Um, we believe in being proactive with the safety. Obviously, you do. You all do, or you won't be attending the webinar. Uh, use outside consultants. We put a little commercial in there for ourselves, but you know, companies outsource a lot of things. If they're roofs leaking, well, they got a maintenance department, but they're busy. So we're going to let roofers come in that do it for all the time. If we need tax help, we're going to bring accounts in, maybe payroll services. Safety is no different. You can get it done more cost effectively getting getting help uh, from outside. Which I believe is going to take us to our next instance. Oh, no, conveying the message. I, I apologize. Um, so, you know, how we go about conveying that message, Jeff? Well, recognize your specialist. They may not call you one, but in your heart, you want to do a good job, you are a specialist, and you've got a tough job. You specialize with health and safety. So you know these acronyms, H&S, health and safety, certified safety professional, personal protective equipment, global harmonization system, the, uh, the permissible exposure level, time-weighted average, etc. Well, that's your profession. You're a specialist. Recognize that there's other talented people in your organization, specifically that, that run the accounting department and, and control the purse strings, like I mentioned earlier. And you have to understand their language, too. Talk to them in their language. Use ROI to prove that H&S so you know, I mean, is a good investment, not an expense. Is, uh, you know, hit them directly with pertinent points, don't over bombard, you know, you come with a softer touch, and then again, speak in their language. And, and speaking of their language, that, that brings us up to our next safe, Insta Safety Poll, and, and these acronyms, how familiar are you with them? Uh, if, if someone throws this out, or you were reading this, or as we're talking about these acronyms, uh, do you know what they mean? Uh, you know, and again, that's P&L, GP, NP, and ROI. Um, you know, some of you may be very familiar with these, others may not be. And it's coming in mixed. Um, it's interesting. It's like interesting. We're, we're just watching with, uh, and, you all. And ROI seems like most people know, but aren't one hundred percent sure. P and L is it seems to be the one that's uh, the least, the least known here. Yeah. Well, let's let's go to the answers here. Okay. So P and L profit loss, profit and loss, uh, gross profit. Well, profit loss is, is basically you have all your income minus all your expenses, and uh, it shows for a specific time period, did you make a profit or a loss? So let, let's understand that. Uh, let's say you go to your account and say, geez, I need some money for safety training, and he knows geez, I'm under pressure to show a profit. If I don't spend any more money the rest of this month, we're going to make a profit. If I spend three or $4,000 on safety, I'm going to go from the black to the red. And that's, not their, I, that's my job to keep us profitable. I understand it. Don't get mad or frustrated, as I've been saying. I understand it. Gross profit, that's before you, you that's the money you come in minus your hardcore expenses, you know, before you, you refine it and take all your other expenses, which leads you to net profit, what's really left over, how much profit is left over. And then we've mentioned time and time again, return on investment. I mean, that's really what they got to be looking at things here is, is, is a return on investment. Uh, because again, if you come in and you're speaking to your boss in investment terms and, and really showing them the return, and again, having that factual information to back it up, that's really where uh, you know they're most likely going to be a lot more receptive. Right, and there's just the definition somebody pulled offline here. Basically, to calculate return on investment, the benefit or return of an investment is divided by the cost of the investment. So there's got to be, an, you know, expense versus return, and you, you, you know, it's part of your job to do that. Next slide. And this one's one that uh, will be very pertinent Turn on to, and, and you know, giving that education yeah. to upper management. And obviously here we're looking at uh, return on investment in safety. 
Right. And, and notice we try to put as many links as we can in because people are skeptical. You know, where did you hear that from? Well, if it comes from a credible source like OSHA.gov, so well, this is a study. The one we had earlier was, I think, Liberty Mutual was the insurance company that came up with, uh, you know, the, the study we, we mentioned before. But uh, there's, um, and that study, by the way, has been publicized by the uh, National Safety Council, where they, they uh, have the, the, the study concluded that for every one dollar a business invests in the safety, they got a three dollar return on investment. Want to get somebody's attention? Hey, hey boss, what about a casino? Huh? What are you talking about? Well, the casino is averaging every dollar. They're, adver they're advertising every dollar you put in our slot machines, you'll get three back. You want to go to the casino? Sure, but I don't believe it. I'm skeptical. How can they do that? Well, safety is a, it's a better investment than a slot machine or, or just the, the, the complacency of waiting. So imagine that. that that's, does your controller know this? Do they understand for every dollar you put in, all the studies by experts show that they can get yeah, a three, I've even seen a three to six like a, a dollar return, return on, on their money. investment. Uh, and, and how likely would you be able to uh, allocate some resources to me if I can get you a 600% with a, a minimum of about 300% on my uh, return on investment and, and see what they say. And again, that, that should open some eyes. Um, and, and really how that happens is, you know, obviously preventing injuries equals avoiding expenses. And again, we mentioned a link in OSHA's website, you know, where you can plug in what happens and what you get, you know, what that expense is going to be. Um, but it was simply, you know, it's, it's easy to think about, but there's a lot of hidden expenses that go into this. And I think Jeff's going to elaborate on those a little bit more. Well, yeah, not all of them. I mean, just, just quickly read these folks. I mean, it's, uh, it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper, you know, with, with when there is an injury. If you really figure out the direct and indirect costs and everything associated with an unplanned, unbudgeted, unwanted, all the above injury, uh, this, this really puts a bump on the road with your, your, your business plan. So I'll, we'll go on to the next slide, Nick. I, I want to show a couple graphs here, and they're, they're very similar. And these are from an, an actual company, uh, but if you if you look at the blue line going up, that's health and safety funding. So if you can convince your company to invest more, notice I said invest, not spend, in the health and safety funding. So that blue line is health and safety funding. Guess what happens to your TCI or total case injury or incident rates? It goes down. That's what usually happens. Now, this next slide appears to be the same thing, but that's the result of spending money in safety. Production goes up, and specifically workers' comp costs will go down, whether you're self-insured self or have an umbrella or you're fully you know, commercially insured. It's still money. It's still a risk. It's still an expense to pay a claim. So more of the story. So, Hopefully Injuries these two uh, safety yeah. is an investment. And again, that's that's the focal point. And as you're walking in to talk to your boss, walk and then to talk to that boardroom, that's that's what's got to be in your mindset. If you believe it, and you got to convey that to them and make them believe it, because then then those funds will be found. Um, you know, going into improving that health and safety program. So uh, in summary, here, Jeff. Well, no doubt about it. Those are good good points, Nick. And in just a, a, a few moments, we're going to have some time for some questions. But we want to take just just a, a moment here to well, summarize we'll, everything we're we'll saying. People, because we do have a few uh, questions we, coming in, but obviously, you know, we want to encourage more. Uh, if there is something that we've hit on here that you'd like us to dive further into, a specific question you might have. Uh, the, the, the bottom bar there in, in the cursor space at the bottom, you know, type in a question, send it over to us. Uh, we're going to be perusing through those and, and trying to find some questions to, to address here at the end here for the last few minutes. Right. We'll be happy happy to take those. You can either call us at 888-403-6026 or uh, go on our website, lancastersafety.com. Uh, under contact us and we'll be happy 
happy to uh, answer any, any further questions you have. But to summarize, the big three, the ethical and legal arguments are pretty easy to sell. But once you get them to agree to that, and then you have a condition come up, then you can say, remember what we agreed on, that uh, you know we, we don't want anybody hurt and we want to be within the law? Well, guess what just happened in the plant? So we have to fix it. Well, we don't have money to fix it. Well, that comes down to number three, which we've tried to give you the business argument, not just complain that we, we need more, more PPE, we need more gloves, explain with great detail all the reasons why you need to spend money on gloves. So uh, hopefully all this information will help you and your executive team understand that safety pays and it's better to be uh, proactive okay, so, yeah, rather I mean, than reactive when it comes to safety. Here and we're we're going to get to all some right, of Nick, these. Are and, we ready? And, and I apologize in advance if we don't get to your question. I'm just going to pull out a few of them that I think would be uh, – commonly or a couple of them are combined questions but as Jeff said if we don't get to yours definitely call us email us go on to our website you know again we'll be happy to address all your questions but obviously with time constraints we're just going to pick out a few here to really address uh, and the first one I see coming in is uh, you know why is management's importance so role or role so important um, and let me repeat that because uh, why is management's role so important? I mean, obviously, we're talking about selling the boss. Why does that even need to be done? Well, first thing I can think of, Nick, is they have the final say. It's great to have a plan, but, you know, OSHA refers to develop, implement, maintain. So maybe you developed a plan and now you want to implement it, or maybe you want to maintain it. One of those key ingredients is believing in it, and another one is having the funds, the resources to do it. So that's why it's important because, uh, I mean, would you even be on this webinar if you had an unlimited budget? If you were hired and said, do whatever's necessary, here's the checkbook, whatever you need, the funds are there, boy, your job would be a lot easier, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, so that's my immediate response is they have the final say. Yes or no? Will funds be okay, allocated? Excellent. Are we um, going to do that clears that do up. this? And, and again, here, here's one. And we already touched on this. Um, I'm not sure if this was a latecomer or if uh, maybe we weren't clear enough. So you know, I'm going to dive back into this because it is a good one. Why should we invest in safety if we've never had an accident? And I'm imagining that's a common question that a lot of people are going to be up against. Uh, you know, we're, we have a great mod rate. We we haven't had accidents. Why why put this additional investment in the safety? Why why not redirect it somewhere else? Why should I wear a seatbelt? I've never had a wreck. I've gone thirty years. I'm a good driver. You know, it's it's then gee, it's uncomfortable. I might get trapped in a fire. You find all reasons. Does that sound familiar? It's complacency. It's a false you know, the alcohol, you know, I'm not an alcoholic. I just really enjoy beer. I've drank it all my life, all day long, uh, and then I drive, I speed in a work zone without my seatbelt on. I mean, so, you know, that's the type of mentality that, that people can have. We, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So you're right. We did touch on it. It's basically complacency. You know, let's, let's not rock the boat. You know, we're just barely making a profit. Uh, you know, we've had a few injuries, okay, well, but, okay, now here's, you know, here's it's not a, a major one, problem. And, and, again, I'm sure that this is something – what if management just won't listen? You know, what if what if the ownership and they're, they're just you know, turning a blind eye? They're putting on their headphones, earbuds in, and they're just blanking you out. And that happens. That's a good question, and that's a challenge. And when we are asked that that question as consultants. Uh, Build an army around yourself. Find coworkers that are willing, that they, they believe in safety. The more people in your organization that can buy in and believe in it. Now, this might be a long process, but one, one of the tips would be for workers, well, for everybody, basically, ask, ask for volunteers on your safety committee. And ask your co-managers, your fellow managers, and... Go to the boss, say, hey, this won't cost you any money, 
but it's something that can really help our production. Oh, now you got their attention. It doesn't cost anything? Well, it costs a little time. I'd like you to attend our safety meeting. I want you to sit on it. I want you to show, I want to see you really care, blah, blah, blah. Again, doesn't cost any money. Might be a good thing. Sell them on attending. And then they'll see firsthand what their people are saying, and they, they'll get them involved. Maybe they're not involved. Well, that's what you're here for. Well, yeah, that's what I'm here for. Now I'm asking you to participate. Are you willing to do so? Then go, go to other departments like HR and say, you know, you wouldn't have, if we had a happier safety culture, you wouldn't have to advertise much. You wouldn't have to interview as much, take the risk of hiring, training somebody, and then they leave. We would retain workers longer if nobody's getting hurt, if we show the, the, you know, that management cares. And they'll probably bring their friends in. So we do, oh, so now you're selling the HR manager on the advantages of safety. And what about media? You know, hey, it wouldn't cost anything to throw up our safety mission right on the home page, right? No, that's a good idea. So that's how you get people involved. That it's a, it could be a long process. Maybe Mr. Big or Mrs. Big doesn't agree right yeah, away, but they can coalition. soon be the minority the instead of the majority. Sell your coworkers and and bring the boss along for the ride. And and yeah, I mean that's that's fantastic stuff. And and we're running low on time here. We're trying to keep this within one hour. So again, I'm gonna we're gonna ask one more question here. Um, again, we didn't get to your question. We can't emphasize it enough. Please contact us. We're here. Uh, that's why we're here is to answer your questions and, and to really help you guys with your safety programs. Call us at 888-403-6026. Or uh, again, obviously you know our website if, or else you wouldn't be on the webinar. You know, Go in there, fill out a contact form, and, and we'll certainly get back to you. But uh, uh, the last question, and, and this one, again, I'm going to turn this into – this is something obviously applies to us a lot. Uh, you know, if I bring a third part, if a third party is brought in, uh, will that make me look bad? Um, you know, or make our staff look bad? Um, and I, I imagine that'd be hesitation. You know, for a lot of safety people, you know, they don't want to bring in a, a third party because, well, you know, that's what, the, what doesn't that mean you're not doing your job? Why, why do you need help? Well, that's a distinct, that's a great question. That's a distinct possibility. So your role is to know and understand what the response could be. And you, like anything, any other request, don't just ask for something. You have to justify the request. Say, and, and if you're selling the boss on safety, say, look, it would cost less, hello, <laughs> it would cost less money to outsource this to people do it every day. You know, we, we missed, missed some auditing for our lockout tag, or whatever it is. It says it would be more cost effective and better for production, better for everybody, if we outsourced this. Instead of saying, oh, I need a couple thousand dollars to bring in a safety consultant. So no, this can happen ahead of time. Uh, the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages okay, of bringing with that, in we're pressing up a, on our one hour mark safety and, uh, again, firm. I want to thank everyone in attendance for attending uh, you know we do appreciate it uh, certainly send your feedback uh, you know we may be reaching out to you for more feedback because you know we really think these webinars can be quite valuable uh, to us as well as you so uh, again thanks everyone for attending I'd like to thanks a special thanks to Jeffrey Lancaster again for taking time to you know obviously con conduct this webinar um, and uh, Jeff, uh, I'll let you say goodbye. Well, I wanted to thank you too, Nick, if I didn't already. And once again, I want to finally thank everybody. Your time is so valuable. We sure hope this webinar can make a difference. We'll look forward to you uh, attending future uh, webinars. Just check our website time to time. And as we said, feel free to call us. We're here to help. From all of us at Lancaster Safety, we want to thank you again and wish you the best of luck with your safety program.